Dark and hot in the light of Christ has shown. 
all of our stains, all of our sin is simply washed away as grace rains down on us, setting us right, setting us clean and pure and righteous and holy because of Christ. How can we say thank you enough? We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to let see. Amen. The grace of God that, uh, that provides a way that we can come into his presence to worship him, to, to pray to him, to, to just be with him. Because we are covered by his grace. Amen. And he invites us in. And that's uh, together we get to do that today. Coming together as a body before the throne of God. Worshiping, praising, celebrating him. And so glad you're with us to do that this morning. So welcome, glad you're here, and, uh, and glad we can be uh, celebrating Jesus together this morning. And uh, you know, maybe you get sick of hearing me say the same things over and over and over. Um, but as of yet, not all of you have filled out a prayer card, so I guess I need to keep reminding you. But in all honesty, we, we love praying for you as a church. When I, when I come into the office and I, and I have my list of prayer requests and things, that I know what's going on in your life, so I know what to be praying. It's it's encouraging, it's enjoy, it, it's it's great to be able to intercede on your behalf. And so, as I always say, on the table back by the media booth, and if you're worshiping in the upper room on the by the doors where you came in, there is a card for your prayer requests, for whatever things you're going through, whatever you're dealing with, so that we can be praying specifically for you throughout this coming week and the things that are going on in your lives. And that is such a privilege and enjoy, an enjoyable thing, uh, a blessing. Uh, hopefully to each of you uh, as you're being prayed for and, and to those of us who are praying as well. There's also a card if you're visiting today that just has some information. It says welcome on it and ask for some information so that we can connect with you and help you get plugged into different areas of ministry around the church uh, and ministries that you can be a part of. And so we invite you to fill out that card as well, uh, to, to help you get uh, connected in the family here, so to speak. So, But with those things, we want to take a moment here again and, and just pray over the day that God has given us and the things that are going on here today. And so, Heavenly Father, we praise you for your grace. God, that before you had created a thing, you already saw the sacrifice that you would have to make on our behalf you made us anyways, so that you could pour out your grace on us. Lord, we delight in that. We celebrate that. God, even today we come before you in, in celebrating communion, and we are in awe of what you've done. Jesus, we thank you. We worship this morning. Holy Spirit, speak. Speak your grace to our hearts in places that uh, perhaps we're feeling shame and regret and, and uh, whatever else. Speak your grace into that. Father, in places where we're feeling angry and, and self-righteous and other things against other people, speak your grace into that this morning as well. But as we were your grace to us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hey guys, the Wyoming Men's Retreat is coming up April 22nd to the 24th. That's a Friday through Sunday. The cost this year is $130, and that's for your lodging as well as your meals up there. Only thing you got to come up with is transportation and meals on the go. So, if you're interested in being a part of this great time, talk to Adam Wynn or Jim Woods as they will have more information. Also, go and grab one of these flyers out in the Welcome Center so that you can get signed up. Just down the hall here is our prayer room. In almost every service, we have someone praying in there for all of us. Now, if you have things that you need to pray for, even right now, we, we invite you to go there to pray or 
or ask whoever is there to pray for you. If you would like to pray, take a look at the sign-up sheet that's on that door and find some open slots where you can be a part of interceding for all of us as we worship on Sunday morning. Registrations are now open for the Art of Marriage Marriage Retreat. Remember, this retreat for all the marriages here at Shine Life Church is going to be October 21 to 23 in Fort Collins, Colorado at the Homewood Suites there. So, if you would like to get more information and to begin the registration process, you can grab a flyer out in the Welcome Center or go to CheyenneAlliance.Church and find the Art of Marriage under the upcoming tab. So go and check it out, find out the information, and get registered. Can't wait to see you at the Art of Marriage Retreat this fall. We just want to give a huge thank you to everybody who's participated in keeping our food pantry stocked. Thank you very, very much. It continues to be used in incredible ways. We do ask that you continue to check out the newsletter to find out what items are needed each and every week as you continue to bring those things for shelf life, our food pantry. Small groups are such an important part of life as we grow together as part of the body of Christ. And we hope that you have found a way to be a part of one already. If you're not a part of a group and would like to find one, there's a couple of ways for you to discover what groups are available, because we have a number of them. One is go and find the green small groups card in the Welcome Center or on the green table in the upper room. Two is to go to shinealliance.church. When you're there, click on the Connect tab and go to Small Groups underneath that. That will give you the list of groups that are available, as well as a, a link to a form that you can fill out about groups that you're interested in. Go ahead and fill that out. Or you can just come and find me and talk to me about what kind of groups are available so that we can find the perfect group for you. As always, there's a number of things going on and plenty of places to be plugged in and, and serving and, and enjoying. But also these are prayer points. I like to think of them both as a, a prayer list and a uh, you know list to put on your calendar. Um, so as you see those announcements and as you think of them, I pray about it as well. Uh, that people would be able to get involved and, and to receive God's blessing through the different things we have going on as a church. We're going to sing a song, and you know we've sung a lot of songs that focus on the grace of God. Um, obviously, it's all by design. We've got communion today. We're talking about a passage from Galatians that speaks about God's grace. And um, so we've had songs that uh, focus all around the grace of God, just how beautiful it is. The reality is, church, that no matter how far you may have fallen, I mean, maybe you've walked with the Lord for years, and over this last little leg of the journey, you just really haven't been um, following well. You've given into some temptations. You've given into some mindsets and things that um, actually hinder your walk with the Lord. You can always come to Jesus, and he will pour his grace out upon you again and again and again. That's the beauty of the gospel. It's not that we receive Christ through faith and then it's up to us to live a perfect life or else God's going to just smack us around. No, it's that we can continue to come and receive grace. And so as we sing this next song, I just want you to realize that if there's something that you need to just lay before the Father today, lay it before the Father. He will give you forgiveness. We know from Scripture that if we confess our sins, He is faithful to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that never changes. He gives us grace upon grace.
truths. When we sin, we can't, like Cain, try to hide from God. Uh, simply just come with contrition and repentance, and He is always faithful to forgive us our sins. It's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing to walk with Jesus. Well, as most all of you know, maybe not even all of you, I, I used to teach high school band in Missoula, Montana for a number of years. Um, before going to seminary and becoming a pastor, uh, it's like a whole other lifetime ago now, but I actually have two music degrees and, and taught for a number of years, played in some big bands around the Northwest and some orchestras and, and different kinds of things. It was like just a whole other life. Um, now, maybe not all of you know this, but a lot of you do, that, that bass trombone is actually my primary instrument. It's the, the 
instrument that I was scholarshiped on all through my undergrad. Um, I actually still play every day. I go home and sort of my way to, to decompress after a day. I'll go home and I'll play about 30 minutes. But, you know, uh, Trump Wilmers would work very well for reading worship. So I don't really use that. Um, use the keyboard. And so, but I'm most all you know that. And so, while I was scholarshiped all through my undergrad, played in some orchestras, and big bands, and some smaller ensembles, uh, Montana trombone chorale, I was a somewhat accomplished trombone player. I'm, I'm not trying to brag or anything, but I, I did fairly well. But over the years, I'll have to confess to you, I have played with some amazing trombone players in a variety of different contexts. I, I mean, even some professional jazz trombone players and, and some big bands. Um, and for those that know jazz, I, I could drop some names, but for, for most of you, you go, who? <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. And some incredible players. And, and while I'm a decent enough player, I actually had some friends as well that were exceptional, amazing trombonists. Uh, for example, my friend Mark, who actually used to teach trombone at the University of Wyoming for a few years, um, he was an incredible trombone player. In fact, he was so talented that his entire education at the University of Montana was paid for in full simply because of how good he played the trombone. And then he went off to do graduate studies at Northwest University right outside of Chicago in Evanston, Illinois, a very prestigious music school where he studied under the principal trombone player for the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. Upon completing his trombone performance degree, it was time to audition for orchestras. That was his desire. And, and despite all of his abilities, he could not land a professional orchestra position. He wound up playing in a ska band in South Chicago for a number of years until he went and taught at the University of Wyoming. I have another friend, Peter incredible trombone player. He actually went to a summer camp that was held in Colorado for trombone players who wanted to become professional musicians. And at this camp, you actually went for, it was like 10 days, maybe a week, I don't remember exactly, and um, you would come and you'd study under other professional trombonists and you would learn more about how to audition, how to prepare for um, professional trombone positions. That experience changed my friend Peter's life. Over 200 trombonists from around the world came to that camp. Every one of them were lights out players. He decided to give up his dream of playing professional trombone. He went to seminary and studied and became a Lutheran pastor. It actually changed the trajectory of his life. You know, I have learned over the years, I don't care how good of a musician you are, there's always somebody better, somewhere. And even if you do make it professionally, there's always somebody gunning for your position. I, I've got some relatives that are professional musicians and they're always looking over their shoulder for the person who's gonna come take them out and take their position. It is a brutal profession in many, many ways. Well, that's all interesting, but what in the world does this have to do with relations? <laughs> Over the past number of weeks, we have seen, as we've been studying through Galatians, a variation on a theme from Paul as we've made our way through this study. Paul has mentioned in a variety of ways, from a lot of different angles, that trying to live for God is not accomplished through works. We cannot do enough things to earn our salvation, nor can we do enough things to develop holiness. It is humanly impossible. Trying to live the Christian life in the power of the flesh is a fool's errand and will only discourage you immensely. And this is why we've said this quote a number of times from Dallas Willard. Most Christians live lives of quiet desperation. They know how they should live. They know what the Christian life's about. They're trying with everything within them to accomplish that in the flesh. They can't, and so they hide it all, and they're desperate, and they're discouraged, and that's how they live their life. We must walk by faith and rely on the power of the Holy Spirit as God pours His grace out upon undeserving people. That's the beginning, the middle, and the end of living the Christian life. It's the only way to live the Christian life. 
anything else will leave you incredibly frustrated and spiritually defeated. And so it's with all of this in mind this morning, then, that I would like to read to you from Galatians chapter 3, verses 15 through 29. A little longer section than what we've been sort of taking off over these weeks, but a, we're going to leave beginning in verse 15 all the way through the end of chapter 3. And Paul writes this. He says, To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it's been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one. And to your offspring, which is Christ. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to one or to whom the promise had been made, and it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now, an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be so then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs. According to the promise. This morning, as we continue our study through the book of Galatians, we're going to talk about law and grace. But I'd like to just pause for a moment and just invite the Holy Spirit again into our study of this word. Lord Jesus, we thank you for today. Holy Spirit, I do pray that you would just open our hearts and our minds to this passage of Scripture. It's a little more complex in some ways. It's hard to follow the arguments, but I pray that as we walk through this, you help us understand how law and grace work together to bring us to salvation, to bring us into right relationship, and may we celebrate that with glad hearts for all that you've given us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Paul, he begins this section of Galatians by giving a human example to illustrate what he's been talking about for a little while now. He's been talking about grace, he's been talking about how works cannot be done to give us salvation or holiness, and he wants to give a human example to sort of illustrate it. Now, during this time, covenants were a binding contract, even man-made ones. And so you have to understand that once a covenant, which was a legal contract, was ratified, it was absolutely unchangeable. That's the way things were at this point in time in this society. If you made a covenant, a legal agreement, if that thing's ratified, you cannot change it after the fact. That was true in all cases. Now, I know that this seems foreign to us today, with all kinds of legal loopholes available for people to get out of keeping their word. But back then, a ratified agreement was binding, and nothing could change that. You know, in many ways, it's quite unfortunate that we really don't operate that way anymore. Some of you may remember back in 1997, when Louisiana passed something called the Covenantal Marriage Law. Maybe that rings a bell for some of you. But um, in case it doesn't, uh, basically this is what it accomplished. Covenant marriage is a legally distinct kind of marriage. It's actually in three states in the United States, even still today, in which marrying spouses agree to, one, obtain premarital counseling, and two, accept more limited grounds for later seeking divorce. Sounds like sort of what marriage should be, but this is an actual um, law on the books in three states. Louisiana became the first state to pass covenant marriage law, marriage law in 1997. 
And then shortly afterwards, Arkansas and Arizona are the other two states that have what's called covenant marriage law. However, since its inception, you know, 25 years ago or so, very few couples in even those three states have opted into covenantal marriage law. And anyway, you think that'd just be the standard for marriage. It gets some premarital counseling, and let's agree not to get divorced, another, unless there's some real serious circumstances. <coughs> in fact, you know, Pastor Siebert and I don't even marry people unless they're agreeable to do that. Um, but, unfortunately, that's not the standard for marriage today. You know, in general, people by and large just don't like to keep their word and their commitments today. They like to make sure they have an off-ramp for any kind of agreement made. And so they'll make sure it's all written up in legalese. I've got a way to get out of this commitment if need be. However, during Paul's time, people did keep their word. In fact, they were legally bound to it. And he is using this to make an argument because of the way in which legal contracts were conducted. I mean, all of that background, this is actually a very, very strong argument from Paul. And if we aren't aware of all the cultural things back then, we lose the weight of this argument. You see, Paul is making an argument from lesser to greater. That's what he's doing. Because a human agreement contract has such weight, he's going from lesser to greater. Basically, what Paul is saying is that, that if man-made covenants hold that kind of weight, and they are unbreakable, how much more God's covenant would be binding? That's the whole point of his argument. If man-made covenants are that strong and binding, how much more God? An argument from lesser to greater. We know from the past couple of weeks as we've been going through Galatians that God made a covenant with Abraham, and Abraham believed it through faith, and he was counted righteous because of his faith response, not because of anything he did. Nothing can change the covenant God made with Abraham, even the law, which came 430 years after God made the covenant with Abraham, which was ratified, if you would, through Abraham's faith. The law does not nullify the previous covenant because a covenant cannot be changed. God pro God's promise with Abraham held true even when the law came into existence. Now, the other main point that Paul is making in this argument is that the promise itself was pertaining to a singular person all along, not many people, not necessarily the nation of Israel. In other words, as Paul points out in verse 16, that singular person is Jesus. You see, the promise that was made to Abraham, which he ratified by his faith, if you would, was fulfilled in Jesus. The promise made to Abraham was fulfilled in Jesus. So justification by faith, the way in which that promise was ratified, which was good for Abraham, is still in effect for all people, and the law does not set that aside. So if you're logically following this argument, now and I, this is why I said that this is sort of a complex passage in a way, you're trying to understand it, but if you're logically following Paul's arguments that he's making here, the obvious question becomes then, what's the purpose of the law? Why did God bring the law about? Why in the world would God give the law if it has no saving power and doesn't replace the original covenants? Well, there are three main reasons for the law. And the first is that the law points out and punishes sin. The law points out and punishes sin. You see, God has a standard for living. He wants and expects his children to be holy. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, you read this. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conducts. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. The law shows us what God's holy standard is, and therefore points out when and where we fall short. We can lay our life against it and see how it measures up. Any person can do that. You lay your life against God's law, 
You lay your life in conduct against what his word says, and you can see clearly where you fail to meet his standard. And then as Pastor Siebert mentioned last week, you realize pretty quickly you're a lawbreaker. Every single one of us are a lawbreaker. And then, like anything else, there are consequences for breaking the law, for wrong behavior. And God's law, it spells that out as well as you read through all of Leviticus. So while the law was never intended to save anybody, it can restrain us. It can keep our behavior somewhat in check. When people are aware of what is wrong and what the consequences are for wrong behavior, it can help us to behave somewhat for fear of experiencing the consequences. You know, I'll be honest, sometimes I behave not because I want to, but because I don't want to get in trouble. I'll just be honest with you today. There are times I would rather drive faster than the posted speed limit because I want to get somewhere. But I don't because I don't want a ticket. And we're all, we all can say, okay, yeah. There are times we behave because we simply just don't want to get in trouble, not because we have some intrinsic motivation to be righteous. I'd rather speed. But I'll keep it in check. Especially because I saw the cop up just a ways, right? Okay? Let's just be honest about this stuff. The bottom line, as we've discussed in the past, sin imprisons everybody. And the law helps to point that out. Even somewhat help us live right. Which then brings us to the next point. The second main reason for the law is that it reveals God's nature and how his children should live. Now, I know that's very similar to what I just said, but the first reason is from a negative perspective. Points out sin and punishment. This point, though, is from a reverse positive perspective. This is who God is, and this is how he wants us to live. Both negative and positive. As we saw from the passage that I read in 1 Peter, God is a holy God. And the law reminds us of that fact. That's who God is. God is completely consistent. And the law shows us the things that are not only important to God, but shows us his very nature. And because we are called to be just like the Lord, it shows us how we should live, what should be our nature, how, what should be important to us. If we want to learn who God is, read his word. Understand his law, and you will come to know the very nature of God. Now, how many of you remember our jumping contest from just a few weeks ago? Okay, a few of you do, and if you remember that, you remember how nobody, even Jeff McMartin, who cheated from the stage, made it close to touching the speakers up there, right? Nobody was even close. And that's the third reason for the law then. It makes us conscious of sin and the fact that we need a Savior. When we look at God's law, it awakens us to sin, our sin, and the fact that we need a Savior because we can't keep this law. Because God's law is holy and perfect, it quickly becomes very apparent. Nobody can keep this. Not one of us. The law actually shows and actually puts a spotlight on our hopeless condition because we cannot do it. We then are left wondering, where can we find rescue? Who is going to save us? As Paul says at the end of Romans 7, what a wretched man I am. Who will save me from this body of death? And it then points us towards Jesus. The only one who can save us. Eternal life is not found in God's law. That was never its intention. Eternal life is found in God's promise, which, as we saw, is fulfilled in Jesus. That was always the intention. The law is holy. It is righteous. It is good. But it cannot bring a person salvation. And this leaves people in a very hopeless state. Much like my friend Peter, when he realized how difficult it was going to be to become a professional trombone player, and so he just quit. I'm done. I can't do this. 
In many ways, this was the state of all people until Jesus came. They realized God's holy standard and their inability to keep it and even do anything about it. The law, in many ways, was a temporary measure that would then lead us to Christ. That's where grace comes in. Again, the law does not save us. It teaches us the need for salvation. It shows us how desperately wicked we are with no hope and something needs to be done. Nobody can keep God's standards. Not one of us, yet they remain. Because of this, all people are in a state of enmity. They are enemies, actually, with God because of sin. And then, all people need a Savior. And Jesus is the only one who gives us that salvation. That's what the law does. It brings us to a point of desperation, of longing, of even hopelessness. But then the hope that is Jesus shines through and it brings us to that realization that actually everything I need is found in Christ. It's found in Christ. That really was the intent of the law all along. It allows people to get to a state of desperation concerning their standing before God. You know, until somebody truly understands sin and how it corrupts everything about them, there's no need for salvation. Salvation isn't so much about God just wanting people to simply live their best life now and experience nothing but goodness. No, salvation is about forgiveness and deliverance from sin. That's what salvation is, something the law could never do. The law points out how far a person has fallen and their total inability to do anything about it. It brings us to a point of brokenness. And it is then that a person can turn to God in faith, receive Christ as Savior, and experience the grace of God. Grace makes no sense unless we get to a point where we understand there is nothing we can do to earn God's favor. We've got to own that before we can understand grace. And then, when we come to God in faith, we receive unmerited favor, all because of Jesus. That's what makes grace, grace. Receiving grace is receiving Christ. And for everyone who receives Christ, they have put on Christ. And when we put on Christ, we are united with each other as children of God. Receiving Christ is putting on Christ. It unites us then with every other spirit-filled child of God. When a person comes to Christ, they do so by taking off the old sinful nature with all of its fleshly desire and then putting on Christ. They are spiritually united with Christ. They have truly become a new creation because Christ lives in them. Yes. This gives a person new purpose, yes. new direction. They are filled with the Holy Spirit. They live by the Holy Spirit. This is such a beautiful thing and something that we celebrate. However, it does not end there because it goes way beyond just the individual. It's not even just about you. Christians are not silos. We don't come to faith in Christ and then just live a solitary hermit-type life. No, people are not created to live in their own sphere without connection, without belonging to even other people. That's what makes verses 26 through 29 so beautiful. Listen again to the last three verses of our passage. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. You see, all true believers are united as one in Christ. This is also by the grace of God. And this is why we refer 
the Shining Alliance Church as a church family. Because that's what we are. We're a family. We are one in Christ. And we get to live out of that reality of that status on a regular basis through connecting and growing and serving as we gather together in a variety of contexts. And this is all by the grace of God and something that we need to come together regularly and celebrate. As we've been going through our study of the book of Galatians, I don't want anybody to get the wrong idea about what Paul is trying to articulate. And he's been hammering this from a number of directions for a number of chapters now. While we are not saved by the law or law keeping, it is not that the law is meaningless. The law is very important in that it helps us understand God better, to know his heart. However, more importantly, the law points us towards Jesus Christ because we realize how sinful we are and there is nothing that we can do about it. Not a thing. Jesus did what we could not do. He paid the penalty for sin by dying in our place. And to all who receive him by believing in his name, through faith, we are given the right to become children of God. This is a pure act of amazing grace and something for which we are forced. Father in heaven, when we consider these things, and I know Paul's argument gets a little complex, and sometimes we can just sort of gloss over it, but it really is profound. The law is important. The law is unchangeable. But even more so, your promise and covenant, which was originally put in place through faith, is unchangeable. And Lord, we confess our sin. We know we're unworthy. We know we can't earn favor. And so we come with broken hearts, with contrition, and humility, and say, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. Who died in our place. Taking the sin of the world upon his shoulders. some point when we die in the future, but salvation now, as we are filled with Christ, made holy and pure and blameless, and living by the power of the Spirit to do that which we cannot do in the flesh. That is the gospel. And I pray even now, if there's anybody here, even if they've come to this church for decades, never truly embrace that gift in faith. Holy Spirit, would you break through in their heart and mind even now? Draw them to you that they may receive grace and salvation, forgiveness and holiness. All for the glory of your name. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, I think it's really only fitting that we end our service celebrating communion. Again, as we've said so many times here at Shine Alliance Church, we practice an open communion. And, and what we mean by that is uh, you don't have to be an active member of this particular church. 
You simply need to be a member of the church. If you come to um, faith in Christ, uh, then by all means, we want you to celebrate um, with us. And the way that we've been doing this for a while, uh, we do have the, um, the, the elements up there at the table, and you can uncover those if you would, God. I'd appreciate that. Um, you can come up as we sing a song and grab a cup and the, the bread and uh, go back to your place and we'll partake together. And then for those that uh, would rather, uh, there's the self-contained elements and those are the gluten-free options as well. Um, you can grab those and uh, go back to your place and, and we'll have a song play uh, for you to join in with. You can uh, sing along if you'd like, use it as a song of meditation or prayer. Um, again, maybe the sin that you need to confess before coming to um, God's table in a right manner, as we're told. And then we will partake of the first element together. And then we'll have a second song, again, for you to um, use to just continue to prepare your heart. And um, as you feel uh, led, then you can uh, we'll partake together of the cup. And, and this is really our time to come before the Lord, celebrate what he has done through the cross. Lord, we do come before you with hearts that are thankful for all that you've given us in Christ. Lord, we thank you for Jesus who went to the cross, paid the penalty that we could not pay. We thank you, Lord, and I pray that as we come to this communion table today, that we would uh, come with grateful hearts, pure and clean hearts. If there's anyone that needs to confess a sin, may they confess it before you in true contrition. Maybe there's something they need to go to. Fix a relationship first. And say, you know what, I'm sorry for the way that I hurt you or the way that I've sinned against you, Lord. May we extend forgiveness and grace and mercy just like you do. We're supposed to forgive as you forgave anyways. That we can come with a pure and clean heart. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, you may come up as you feel like
one of those words that just it feels right on the tongue, doesn't it? It just feels good to say. Sort of like hope. That's another word that just feels good to say. And Jesus, he went to the cross. And the bread represents the body of Christ. Jesus suffered. It was painful. He knew what he was facing. And he prayed, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. If you can take this cup, I will gladly hand it off. But he was resolute. And he, he knew that death had to occur for forgiveness of sin. And he willingly went. He willingly went. He was beaten, bruised, faced anguish and pain. He did it out of love. Because that was the only way. Lord, we come before you with grateful hearts for the body of Christ. Jesus willingly went to the cross, suffered tremendous anguish, and he willingly did it for me, for each and every person. He did it out of love so that we could have forgiveness, that we could have life. For that we say, one more song or you can use it as a point of prayer or meditation before we're taking the cup today. scripture that that wasn't sufficient. It had to be done over and over and over again. 
because people continue to sin. But the blood of Christ, the Lamb of God, is the perfect once and for all sacrifice that covers the sin of the world, past, present, and future. Jesus also called it the cup of the new covenant. And as we just learned, the covenant is an unbreakable agreement. It was an agreement between God and all people. That whoever received Christ, who call upon his name for salvation, shall be saved. And nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Father, we come before you with grateful hearts for the cup, symbolizing the blood of Christ that was shed for the forgiveness of our sins, washing us pure and clean, sealing us with you, and nothing can change that when we come to Christ in faith. So again, from the very bottom of our hearts, we say thank you in Jesus' name. I'm going to invite the praise team to come up. We're going to close with one last song today. Again, we've been focused on and talking a lot about God's amazing grace. Uh, sung a couple songs with even the words amazing grace in it. And I think it's only fitting that we sing yet another song about God's amazing grace. If nothing else, I want you to walk out of this room today celebrating, receiving and just sort of being washed by God's amazing grace. Let's stand together, church, and we close with one last song.
thank you so much for the, your amazing grace. Unmerited favor poured down upon undeserving people, but I guess that's what makes grace, grace. And your grace is never exhausted, it's limitless, it knows no bounds, and for anyone who comes to you in true brokenness and contrition and faith, receives the right to be God's children, to be filled with your presence, and to live lives of holiness that honor and glorify you. Lord, go before us today, I pray, as we go to class or go off to other things we have going on, may we walk in your grace and your mercy. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go in grace and peace. We'll see you next time.